Hi, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon as it is. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. Um, we're featuring Dr. Daniel Portnoy from UC Berkeley today. Um, I also want to make sure that um, as you walked in, you all picked up a schedule of our future briefings. And if you plan on coming, please RSVP so we make sure to get enough food and enough seats for everybody. It's a, kind of a full house today, and we're running out of food. Um, that being said, I'd like to thank the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for their generous grants for this briefings, for these briefings. Uh, it's because of them that we are able to bring such esteemed scientists to Washington and also provide a, a small little lunch for you all. Um, I'd also like to thank the co-chairs of the caucus, and that's Representative Brian Bilbray from California, Representative Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Rush Holt from New Jersey. Uh, it's because of their commitment, dedication, and ongoing support that the caucus has been thriving for over 22 seasons now. Um, so like I mentioned, today we will be hearing from Dr. Daniel Portnoy. Dr. Portnoy is a professor at UC Berkeley with joint appointments in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology in the School of Public Health. He is the co-faculty director of the Berkeley Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases. Today he will discuss with us his research into the bacteria Listeria. Most of us know of Listeria as a deadly foodborne associated with uh, deadly foodborne bacteria associated with cantaloupes. Dr. Portnoy, however, studies this bacteria as a way of treating cancers. <coughs> He has received numerous awards and honors. He is one of the most cited of individuals in the field, and he has published over 100 papers. So with that, I would like to bring up Dr. Portnoy. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and thank all of you for coming today. Yeah, I believe that originally the invitation was stimulated by the outbreak, foodborne outbreaks of listeria, specifically the cantaloupe outbreak that occurred, and I will touch on that today, but um, that is not really where my expertise lies, and what we'll do today is kind of cover uh, two areas. I'll give you some background on this organism, a little bit about how it causes disease at the cellular level, and then I'll switch and tell you a little bit about how we, uh, our immune system deals with listeria, and then put these together and, pr and try to explain why um, we and others are using listeria for cancer immunotherapy. And meanwhile, I think I'll leave it up to you whether you want to ask questions during the talk or wait till the end. But I'm, I'm, I, there will be, certainly be time at the end. And lights, I think, we'll see if we're okay. I don't know how much. Um, so let me just start. Um, as Lynn mentioned, one of my other roles is at UC Berkeley is as a faculty director of a Center for Emerging Neglected Diseases. So let me put a little global perspective on infectious disease. All we have here in this um, slide is, is uh, two pie charts. Um, if we're looking at causes of infectious disease in the world, this is, from, this is mortality. There's a number of obvious reasons that people succumb, but I wanted to draw your attention to what are often referred to as the big three infectious disease agents, the causative agent of tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria, that cause about 50% of the mortality worldwide from infectious disease. Now, although these diseases are caused by three very different types of organisms, a virus, a protozoan, and a bacterial pathogen, they all have something in common. That is, they're intracellular. And when pathogens live within our cells, the way the immune system has to deal with that is very different than what many of us are used to. Many of you, what you often think about for immunity, you think about antibodies. And what I'll tell you about later today in this talk is that the immune system has to recognize infected cells as being different and has to kill those infected cells. And that's a different type of immunity called cell-mediated. And this is an area of research um, that is, is very active. And one of the reasons is that we, 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 fit, we lack vaccines, or really effective vaccines, for these types of pathogens. And I'll also make the comment that the way our immune system deals with cancer overlaps with the way we deal with intracellular pathogens. Again, recognizing our cells, ourself, and then having to kill those cells. And so this will all hopefully become more obvious as we move along. Now, with regard to the cell biology of intracellular pathogens, the 
kind of the understanding that we are at today is that each intracellular pathogen has a certain niche within our cells in which it grows. So don't worry about the details in this slide at all. All I'm representing here is a cell, different compartments of a cell. And for example, one of the organisms I already mentioned, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, lives within a membrane-bound component, membrane-bound compartment of the host cell, uh, which we call a vacuole. Other pathogens live in or modify these vacuoles, and some organisms live right in the cytosol. And so the organism we're going to talk about today, Listeria, actually Listeria monocytogenes, is one of these pathogens that lives directly inside of the host cell cytosol. So let me tell you more about Listeria. So as we have already heard now, both in the introduction and I've alluded to, is that very relatively recently, there was this big outbreak, one of the biggest outbreaks of Listeria associated with cantaloupes. And all I did is snap a few of these um, quotes from the newspapers illustrating how serious this outbreak was. So let me tell you more about Listeria. Actually, um, so first of all, it's a, can you hear me here as, as well? Okay. It's a rapidly growing organism, and that means is it doubles in the laboratory or inside of a cell every 40 minutes. Um, it's ubiquitous, pretty much anywhere you would look, and it's, it's foodborne. And it's, um, by ubiquitous means it's everywhere, so therefore it is, I hate to spoil your lunch, but it is likely that you're eating listeria, because it's every, but at very low levels. Now, if you are pregnant, or immunocompromised, you're more sensitive to this infection. In fact, most cases, almost all cases, are either in the pregnant women and immunocompromised. Now, this organism has a very broad niche. It's isolated from, isolated from 50 different warm-blooded animals. Um, and it also has this characteristic that's unusual for pathogens, is that it, has this, it can grow at four degrees, or it can grow in, your, in the refrigerator. So that's why one of the reasons it causes problems, is that it can continue to grow even at refrigerated temperature and because it's ubiquitous. Now, as I, uh, I will continue to talk about as an important pathogen, but much of what I'm going to talk about today is going to stress that for 50 years, this bug has been used as a model pathogen for studies of intracellular pathogens. And I'll explain why as we move along. Um, now, as I said, we all eat listeria often. And again, if you're pregnant, the advice is the public health has done a really good job of preventing listeriosis by advising individuals who are pregnant what to avoid eating, and basically uncooked foods, and to be very careful with uncooked foods, soft cheeses, deli food, and even salad. And so the incidence of disease is really low with listeria, but fatality can be quite high, sometimes as high as 40%. And in adults, again, usually immunocompromised, it can cause meningitis. Now, the best um, defined epidemic was called the Mexican style cheese outbreak, uh, which occurred in the mid 80s. And in this case, 142 individuals contracted listeriosis. And it turned out that every one of them had eaten the exact same <coughs> cheese, the soft cheese. And like in most cases, 93 were either pregnant or it was in their offspring. Of the other non pregnant adults, all had other predisposing conditions, but transplants, alcoholics, the elderly, and a few with HIV. Um, and there were a number of deaths. And in this case, it was tr the organism was traced. That they had all eaten the, the same organism because isolated from the patients, and they found the same organism um, in the cheese, and it turned out in this case that their pasteurization system had failed. Anyway, so that really was established listeria as an important foodborne pathogen. Now, um, in my laboratory and in others over the past few decades, we've been studying the basic biology of how this organism causes disease. And I'm going to go through that in this, um, take some time with this uh, diagram. So what we have here is a cartoon, and this represents two different cells, and these are the bacteria. And this cartoon, excuse me, was taken um, from these electron micrographs. So in each case, so here, for example, is a cell internalizing or ingesting listeria itself, here it is here, and then the bug finds itself within what we call a, a vacuole or a phagosome. And here again, it's a cross-section of the bacterium. 
the bacteria do not grow in this compartment. They have to escape into the cytosol um, where they can grow. And they use a protein that I'll talk more about called Listerylysin O that is involved in disrupting this membrane. You can see here that the membrane has been broken and the bacteria then find themselves in the cytosol. Once in the cytosol, they produce another protein called ACT-A which causes these actin filaments to enshroud the bacteria and you get these, ah, excuse me, and you get this, um, these actin clouds around the bacteria and eventually these tails and the bacteria move through the cell eventually into these, they're extruded from the cell and the neighboring cell then can ingest the bacterium and so that what these bacteria are able to do is enter one cell and once they enter one cell, they never have to leave again. They can spread from cell to cell. And by eight hours in the laboratory, if you look in the microscope, you'll have 10 cells infected within eight hours. So in a, in a short work day, you can observe quite a lot of uh, growth. And the bacteria are doubling every 40 minutes along the way. Okay. So this is a movie, a time-lapse video microscopy of Listeria inside of a cell. And what you're seeing here are the bacteria at the end of these tails, and then these acting tails are propelling the bacteria through the cell. Now, this, has been a, this was observed quite a few years ago, and it turns out that, as I pointed out in the previous slide, the bacteria need to produce a single protein called ACT-A. And this ACT-A protein is all that was ne is necessary to um, get this movement in the cell. And so this is really a paradigm for how pathogens can exploit or take advantage of their host cells. Simply by getting into the cytosol, expressing this one protein, then the, they let the host do the rest. The act A protein can be purified, put on a bead, put in cellular extracts, and you can barely tell the difference between those beads and listeria. And in studies that I'm not going to have time to talk about today, we and many of my colleagues in the field really learned an awful lot about basic processes of host cells by studying this pathogen, listeria. Okay. Here's another pretty picture, just for visual pleasure. Of Here's listeria stained in green inside of a cell, and the actin is stained in red, and you see these nice tails. This represents the bacteria moving in the cytosol. Bacteria who lack this protein, ACT A, are completely attenuated for virulence. They're over a thousand fold less virulent in mouse models, and as I'll tell you, they're also safe in humans. And so, by, again, by studying this basic science, we learned about this protein, which ends up being part of the vaccine strain we'll tell you about later in the talk. Um, here's another fun picture, just showing here, the back, here's a cell, the nucleus of the cell. You have bacteria with their tails, and here's one where the bacteria is shooting out of the cell. Here's it shooting out of this cell and entering into this cell. So again, by understanding the basic biology of the pathogen, it allows you to at least have some appreciation for how the immune system might deal with this organism. Because once this bug is inside of a cell, obviously antibodies are not going to be protective because they are able to go from cell to cell without ever seeing the extracellular environment. Okay. Now, by using a variety of methodologies, mostly genetic, that is, you can make mutants, grow these bacteria in the laboratory, you can isolate mutants and find mutants that aren't able to enter cells, mutants that aren't able to grow in cells or able to spread. And by doing that, a number of genes have been identified and one region of the genome that has been particularly well studied is this region we call the PRFA regulon. And all this represents is a little snippet of the genome of Listeria and here we have a number of genes that are on the chromosome all together. And these within this region are some very interesting and important genes. So um, as I already mentioned, the ACT-A gene is right here. This gene is necessary to encode the ACT-A protein, which is important for that active polymerization. But now I'm going to tell you a little about the HLY gene. HLY codes for a protein called Listerylysin O, or I'll call it LLO. And what this is right here is a blood agar plate Many of you over your lifetime have gone to the physician with a sore throat or taken your children and they'll streak your throat um, looking for hemolytic bacteria. And, without, and so many bacteria are hemolytic. That is, you plate them on blood agar and surrounding the colony is a zone of clearing, which isn't showing up all that well, but I think you can see it, 
which represents the secretion of a protein that causes red blood cells to lyse. This is diagnostic. And in Listeria, like many bacteria, produce one of these hemolysins. So this is, uh, these are called the cholesterol-dependent pore-forming hemolysins, or CDCs for cholesterol-dependent cytolysin. In Listeria, if you mutate this gene that encodes LLO, they're 100,000-fold less virulent. And then when you look in the microscope, they fail to escape from the phagocytic vacuole. So the point of this, this molecule is necessary for getting out of the phagosome. Now, as often in biology, there's one molecule, and you'll look, and many other bacteria have them. In fact, there are 28 different pathogens that produce molecules like LLO that have this very intriguing biochemistry. They bind to membranes. They oligomerize into these big rings, and these insert into the membrane and, and generate big holes. And they have lots of different functions for different pathogens. But of all these 28 members, only one is made by an intracellular pathogen, and that's Listeria lysino. So all the other pathogens that have these are pathogens such as the organism that causes pneumonia, Streptococcus pneumoniae, or Streptococcus pyogenes, the flesh-eating bacteria, um, or Clostridium perfringens, which causes uh, ga uh, gangrene. And these are extracellular. Listeria has evolved and, made, and evolved very specific changes in this molecule that allow it to act within a phagosome of cells. Now, I'm going to tell you about one of those experiments that we did that had a pretty striking effect on the way we viewed um, intracellular pathogens and these molecules in general. So, um, right. so I, I told you uh, that there are um, 28, 28 members of this family. One of them that is very sim the most similar to Listeria is called perfringia lysino. Now this is expressed by a non-intracellular pathogen. So we just asked a very easy question. What happens if we replace LLO with PFO? Remove the LLO gene and replace it with perfringial isono on the chromosome of Listeria. Well, when you generate this, engineer this organism, and then you infect cells, this is what you see. You may not recognize this right away, but so let me help you. This is a macrophage that has eaten, here's some bacteria, one, there's a few right there that has eaten this new strain, and whereas Listeria normally grows without killing the host cell, I showed you many examples of that already, this cell explodes. And this is a cell that has just, has just lysed and died. And so what we've learned is that if Listeria expresses perfringial lysino instead of LLO, they, the, cell, they, the cell is killed, and this bug is completely avirulent. So even though it can get out of the phagosome, can grow and kill the cell, it's a virulent. And so the take home message is that intracellular pathogens don't want to kill the host cell. If they, once they kill their host cell, they've, lo they've lost their niche and they're no longer virulent. And although I'm not going to talk about it today, cell death is a very ex important area of biology. And we now know that Listeria uses a number of mechanisms to avoid killing its host cell. And if it ever, whenever it kills its host cell, it becomes attenuated. Okay. So again, my laboratory has studied this protein. This is a stick figure of Listeria lysino. Let's not worry about any of the details. But over the years, we've isolated various mutants. For example, this mutant, LLO, which we call L461T, has a different pH optimum. Normally, LLO acts at the acidic pH of a phagosome. This one acts at a phagosome and in the cytosol, and then is toxic and it is less virulent. We have other mutants that aren't expressed in the cytosol, and they become even, excuse me, they become even uh, more uh, attenuated. So here we're just looking at the virulence in animals. And as the more toxic they become, the less virulent they become. And it turns out that this molecule is regulated at almost every level that we can look at. Okay. So that is just a little snippet about one virulence factor, Listeria lysino that I'm going to tell you about um, for today. Now we're going to switch and talk a little bit more about listeria in immunology. Okay. So the, the observation that has been around for 50 years, in fact, this is the 50th anniversary of a paper from 1962 by George Mackinnis, where they first started using listeria, and they being immunologists, um, as a model system. And again, it's a model system because unlike so many of these other 
very important global pathogens. Listeria is much easier to work with. It's, sub it's, it's highly amenable to analysis. And um, there's a great, it is a very nice mouse model to study infection. So in this model, you can infect mice with an uh, infection that is sublethal. The mice get a little bit ill. They recover. And within a week, they clear the infection. And then for the rest of the life of the mouse, it's completely resistant to infection. You can come back with 10 lethal doses, and the mouse will be completely resistant. We usually, in the laboratory, do 30 days, but it can go out to six months. Now, the more important thing to remember that in this, this, this immunity, so Listeria induces this incredible, this really potent immunity, and we're going to talk about why as we move along. Antibody plays no role during infection. That's the first thing. Another thing to point out is that if you use killed Listeria or a killed vaccine, you get no protective immunity whatsoever. And this is a really fundamental observation. If we want to make vaccines to all these other pathogens, and I tell you that you can't use a killed bug, then you have to use a live bug. Or you have to understand why the kill isn't working, and maybe from that information, we can rationally design killed vaccines. So that's the kind of the rationale for a lot of the basic science here. We have a system that a live infection induces immunity. A killed one doesn't. We want to understand why. Okay. Now, one other bit that now you'll be able to understand is that LLO minus bacteria, those bacteria that are alive but fail to escape from the phagosome, also um, fail to provide protective immunity. So what is it about getting to the cytosol that's important? Now, as I'm going to talk about, Listeria is being developed because it's so good at inducing this type of immunity, and it's being developed as a, ve a vaccine vector for both cancer and infectious diseases. And I like to disclose that I have a financial interest in one of the companies that is developing Listeria. And we work and collaborate um, on some of this work. Now, and I tell you that Listeria induces this robust and protective cytotoxic T cell response. So what's a cytotoxic T cell? Well, a lot of you know what an antibody is or at least you have a good feel for it. Again, um, the arm of the immune system that's responsible for eliminating listeria is called a cytotoxic T cell. Cytotoxic T cells are able to recognize an, inf are able to recognize an infected cell and kill that infected cell, the so-called kiss of death. They recognize antigens that are particular to the pathogen or the cancer cell and kill it. So these are immune cells that have to be developed after seeing um, the antigen. One, however, in the, in, in the field of vaccinology, one of the really unmet needs, medical needs, is developing ways to induce these types of cells in, in humans. And Listeria can do that. Okay. So I've already shown you this, this model. And I've told you now that bugs that are stuck in this vacuole fail to immunize, whereas bacteria that get out of this vacuole can immunize. Now, bugs that are lacking the ACT-A protein, so they can't do the cell-to-cell -cell spread, they just grow in the cell, they, they, they are immunogenic. So why? So one of the hypotheses that we formulated was that the host cell responds differently to bacteria in the cytosol. So this is a very simple question one could ask. Can a host cell discriminate between a bug stuck in a vacuole and a, and a, and a bug that's now in the cytosol? And the answer is yes. And so here, all we're going to look at is, um, this is called a, a northern blot. We're looking at me messenger RNAs that are being expressed by the infected macrophage. And we have... Um, three panels here. We're looking at three different cytokines. Here's uninfected macrophages. Here's macrophages infected with wild-type listeria. So they're, they're in the cytosol. The wild-type listeria induce something called tumor necrosis factor and interferon beta. We're going to talk more about interferon. I'm just going to call it interferon from now on. The bacterium that's stuck in a vacuole induces another cytokine. So the answer was yes. If bacteria get into the cytosol, the host cell knows it. So the question is, how does it know it? What is it seeing, and how does it see it? So here's a very simple diagram. 
bacteria in a vacuole induce some cytokines, that's not, but bacteria that get into the cytosol make something, question mark, that's seen somehow, and that leads to expression of interferon beta. Now, behind all of this is the hypothesis that, if we, that these molecules are possibly important immunostimulatory molecules that can lead to the expression of CDA T cells. So let's try to, how are we going to find these molecules? Where again, we are going to use genetics. And so here is a simple genetic screen where you take mutant bacteria, and, you, and we've screened pretty much every, we mutated every gene in the bacterial genome, and one by one, infect, grow the bacteria up, infect uh, cultures of macrophages for four hours. We then take the supernatants, add them onto another cell that makes luciferase, which, can be, which generates light, if it sees interferon, and simply look for mutants that induce more or less light. It's rather simple. Um, and identify bacterial mutants that turn on more interferon or less interferon. And then once you get a mutant, you can then sequence the genome and find out where your mutation was located. And here, we're simply looking at a snippet of the bacterial genome. And here's an example of a mutant mutation that results in the bacteria inducing 20 times more interferon. And here's an example of one that turns on 20 times more, less, excuse me, three times less interferon. And what we learned from this was that in this case, we knocked out a gene that resulted in this gene being overexpressed. And this one, we knocked out a, a related gene. And what were these genes? Well, they were both in what's called MDRs, or multi-drug resistant transporters. Now, multi-drug resistant transporters have been known about for years. In fact, they're ubiquitous. All cells, from bacteria to humans, have multi-drug um, resistant transporters. In bacteria, these are usually known to be involved in, in, in exporting molecules like antibiotics. But their endogenous substrates are really not well known. But what they do is they pump molecules out of cells. And, and so therefore, this led to a very simple hypothesis. Listeria, multi-drug efflux export, multi-drug resistance exporters, export a ligand, a molecule, that is recognized by the host. And so here we are, Listeria. They produce a, a transporter, and they secrete something. And that activates an, uh, this, uh, an unknown receptor. And that leads to interferon beta. So what is this molecule? Well, we have some nice strains now from the genetics. We have various strains that induce different levels of interferon, over, ranging over 60-fold. So simply by taking the supernatants from bacteria going into different conditions, looking for an activity. Simply take the supernatant fluid, permeabilize the membrane of macrophages, and look for an activity. And then here we are looking at just different fractions from, a, um, from conventional kind of biochemistry and looking for the ability of these purified fractions to induce this uh, luminescence response, which means there's interferon. And here's the mutant that induces 20 times more interferon. It's inducing a lot more of this molecule. So here it's secreting this molecule. So we can now take this molecule, subject it to mass spec analysis, and identify it. And what we found was that there was a single molecule that was called cyclic dye AMP. And it turns out that this is a newly discovered bacterial molecule. There's only about 10 papers now over the last few years. It's been identified now in Listeria, in Bacillus, in Staphylococcus, and just the other day in Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's essential for life. In Listeria, you can't knock it out but the, it stimulates the host interferon response. And so we can now make this molecule, inject it into cell, give it to cells or into experimental animals, and you get interferon. So this is an, an essential bacterial molecule, and it turns on this response. So that's what we were looking for. So now we know that Listeria induce, expresses these multidrug efflux pumps. It secretes this new little molecule I haven't gone into how we know it, but there's a molecule that has been discovered by, my, uh, by a number of labs and in collaboration with a lab where my colleague Russell Vance at, um, at, at Berkeley, we showed that a molecule of the host called Sting is the receptor for cyclic dye AMP and other related cyclic dye nucleotides such as cyclic dye GMP. And that leads to this interferon response. So we've answered those questions. Okay, so now, 
I've told you a little bit about the basic pathogenesis of this bacterium, that it has to get into cells, it has to get to the cytosol and grows. I've told you about the immunology a little bit. I told you that this bug induces this, this type of uh, innate immune response with cyclic IMP, and it turns on this type of immunity that leads to these cytotoxic T cells that can recognize cells. So why is Listeria a potential vaccine? Well, for one, it's very amenable to analysis. And also, it induces the exact type of immunity we want. Also, I've told you that mutants exist that are attenuated for virulence, yet immunogenic, such as the ACT A deficient mutant. I've told you that it stimulates both innate immunity, such as the interferon response, and acquired immunity, such as cytotoxic T cells, both of which we think are important. And lastly, as we now know from studies in humans, you can take these attenuated strains and inject them into humans at very reasonable doses, high doses, and they're safe. So that was critical. Okay. Now, I'm a microbiologist and didn't know that much about this field of immunotherapy. Um, and some of what I've learned, I learned from reading a book um, called A Commotion in the Blood. And half this book is dedicated to discussion about William Coley and something called Coley's toxins. Around the turn of the set, Coley was a physician in New York City. And around, um, he made this, these observations that certain individuals with certain types of tumors, specifically uh, sarcomas, would, would have spontaneous recovery, often after association with an infectious disease, streptococcal or staphylococcal or other infectious agents. Now, although this was anecdotal, the studies that he eventually did and others have done subsequently suggested that even that, that, there's an, that if you can stimulate the immune system, possibly with other um, infectious agents, something they call fever therapy, you can sometimes cause reduction of the tumors. And so the rationale behind using Listeria was that you could use Listeria to induce this so-called innate immune system, which revs up the immune system, and we could ex clone a foreign gene to Listeria and hopefully convert the uh, immune system or to, uh, to persuade the immune system to recognize this antigen as foreign. And in mice, it works like a charm. Um, so the first thing is we have vectors that we can clone a foreign gene into, and what we use now is we use, from what I've already told you, we use the beginning of the ACT-A gene, the ACT-A promoter, the first few amino acids, and then we can hook up any foreign antigen. Um, for, hu for immunotherapy, we can take a human antigen that's overexpressed on tumors, change the codon so it looks more like a Listeria gene, and get Listeria to express that. We have also are now working on vaccines for things like excuse me, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and HIV and malaria, and we can do the same thing. So basically, any foreign antigen can be expressed by Listeria, and in a mouse model of infection, you can get a cytotoxic T cell response generated to this foreign antigen now. Now, the first study that was done in, um, to show this, well, not the first study, but among the studies that were shown in, in mice, I'm not going to go into any details, but in this experiment, this is called a therapeutic anti-tumor a vaccine trial in mice in which the mice were either immunized just with um, buffer or the ACT-A minus strain alone or with an ACT-A minus strain expressing an antigen that was specific to the tumor. And the vaccine was given after the tumor, so it's called therapeutic. And what we, we, we're, we're, we're quantitating the number of metastases in the lungs um, a, month after, uh, a, a month after administration of the vaccine. And what we see here is that, again, these are, the, these are the lungs of the infected mice. They're heavily metastatic. Even giving ACT-A alone reduces the burden. Right? I told you that just having the infection might have a, what's called, a bit of an effect on the immune system. But if you have Listeria expressing the tumor antigen, two different versions of it, you eliminate metastasis completely. And in this case, the ACT-A strain doesn't provide any protection to the mice for survival, but the various Listeria strains can completely cure the mice. So this was what we call the preclinical studies that led to clinical trials. Um, again, I'm not a clinician, and this work was now done by a biotech company. A number of biotech companies have done clinical trials, and I'll just review one of them um, today. And so this has uh, been published now, and this was a phase one clinical trial. Um, and in this case, Listeria was engineered to express an antigen called mesothelin. 
Mesothelin is an antigen that's overexpressed on a number of cancers, especially pancreatic cancers, small cell lung, non-small cell lung, excuse me, and ovarian and uh, mesotheliomas. And in each of these patients, um, this was uh, patients who had failed other treatments and whose life expectancy was in the three months or less um, range. So these were, this was very sick individuals. Okay, so in this, tr in this trial, there were 17 patients treated, and again, seven pancreatic, two, five with mesothelioma, three with non-small cell lung cancer, and two with ovarian. And uh, most of these patients were, did not survive, but uh, six of the 17 did survive greater than 15 months after the first dose of the vaccine. And as of the last time um, we got, I have information, two of them were still alive three and a half years later. And this is not clinically significant still. This is all anecdotal because what the, the, design of the, treat, the design of the study was such that uh, um, it, it's not going to be statistically significant until you do a, a larger phase two trial. That's what's going on right now. So right now there's a trial with the same vaccine for 80 patients and we're in the a company that's conducting this, Adura Biotech in Berkeley, is about halfway through that uh, trial. Yes? Is there any um, indication of what types of those different cancers were more receptive to the treatment? Um, it's too early to comment on that. So let me summarize what we're, what we're doing now. Um, so as I said, there's clinical trials being done um, mainly for pancreatic cancer right now, but a lot of others are being proposed. Um, our lab and others are developing listeria for, other, for infectious disease applications. So per, we are working on a tuberculosis vaccine, and we'll see how that, how that works. Um, and then it's, it's also exciting that the preliminary data using cyclic DMP by itself or in various other uh, formulations is inducing CD8 T cells in, in mice as well. And so one of the hopes is that this adjuvant that was discovered may be able to replace listeria at some point or certainly have other applications. And let me acknowledge uh, some of the pe people who have been involved with this. Um, I'm not mentioning all the dozens and dozens of past trained, present and past trainees that are in my lab. I've had wonderful collaborators over the years, especially working with, with immunologists and cell biologists. Um, in the Bay Area, we have a, a number of us who uh, share an NIH-sponsored program project grant to work on intracellular pathogens. As I mentioned, I collaborate and I'm a consultant for Duro Biotech, and I want to express my gratitude to the NIH, specifically the National Institute of Allergy um, and Infectious Disease, who has sport, sp sponsored my research for 25 years. Thank you very much. And uh, if there's any questions. So I don't know much about the like history of this area, but once, so if you, if this is used as a treatment, is there any danger of it mutating and becoming a problem? Um, the, 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 the strains that are used as vaccine vectors have been uh, genetically modified with deletions so that, the, that they can't revert. So big chunks of DNA have been taken out of the strain. We're always working on ways of making strains safer and safer and eventually even creating uh, or, uh, killed vaccines, but they cannot, they cannot revert. Yes. You mentioned targeting cancer, existing uh, cancer cells with this. Is the goal to establish a vaccine and it had a treatment cancer in the community? So yeah, the issue is whether we're talking about uh, therapeutic versus prophylactic vaccines. And most of us, when we use the term vaccine, people usually think they're prophylactic. This is therapeutic. When I talk about infectious disease applications, I'm thinking um, uh, prophylactic. But for cancer, uh, right now, it's, it's all therapeutic. Basically, helping your own immune system combat the, the, the cancer. Does it have applications for autoimmune diseases? Um, it's conceivable, but it's not currently being looked at. Mm -hmm.
Have any of the application caused um, any of the strands to survive cell deletion in any form? So, um, can you repeat that? Have any of the mutations that you've done to the cell or to the strands caused them to survive any form of cell deletion? Okay, so you're asking me if any of the deletions we've made in the bacterium itself cause it to survive cell deletion on, in, once it's inhabited a larger cell. Um, no. Okay. All the, the deletions make it uh, less survivable. Yeah. Yes? Um, do you think, I guess, with the tumor cells, would they uh, inhibit the you know, the immune response, more likely from the, from the bacterial infection. Have you found that? Because I know that's sometimes that's an issue. I'm sorry. Uh, can you? So, like, maybe this would be a therapeutic uh, vaccine. Right? Mm -hmm. Will the tumor cells themselves tamp down on the immune response? Well, the immune system, the reason you have the, the reason one, I mean, by the time you have a tumor, it's obvious that your immune system has failed. Yeah. And so that, that's already it before you start this. But the, the, the idea here is that the vaccine will, it has the opposite of what you're saying. We're going to what's called break tolerance mm -hmm. and to, um, if you will, trick your immune system or reactivate your immune system to recognize the tumor and to eliminate it. So it's the opposite. That's exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Do you feel hopeful given what you found so far about the future of this area? Yeah, I feel very hopeful. I mean, part of it is um, there's been a number of other um, approaches for immunotherapy that um, either are vaccines or therapeutics uh, that uh, stimulate the immune system that are now showing very promising results in other, uh, for other tumors and other, in other situations. So the, I feel that the, the area of immunotherapy is an is a, is a, is a up and coming area. Um, with Listeria, we'll just have to see if this is, the, if this is uh, gonna be useful. Uh, I'm not. Have you looked at the dynamic of the interaction between the host and the pathogen using the next generation sequencing or such technologies? Um, my laboratory is certainly using next generation sequencing technologies to be able to look at bacterial mutants in the laboratory for other reasons, but not in a dynamic of a host. So. Thank you.